Thank you, Sophia. And uh, good to talk with all of you. I'm speaking to you from Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a pity that I cannot uh, be there in person and we're all kind of working virtually, but we'll make the best of it. So the topic that I wanted to talk about is more, more and more, I think all of you are hearing the word inner source come into our vocabulary in the open source community. And all of you know a lot about open source um, and it's been around since say the early nineties. So I want to kind of dissect the two words and share with you what I think are the similarities between this new movement called inner source and what we know as open source and also what are some of the differences between these two terms and how do they connect together from an organizational perspective and other uh, ways. So who am I? Um, my name is Nithya Ruff and I run the open source program office at Comcast. And you can follow me on Twitter at Nithya Ruff and you can also contact me um, at nithya.ruff at gmail.com. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been a tech woman for a very long time. I uh, went to uh, computer science school in the 80s and I started as a coder um, and then moved on to product management, product marketing, strategy. Uh, today, I work in the CTO office and I work on technology strategy. I'm really passionate about open innovation and I define it as uh, not just innovating inside a company, but innovating globally like open source does with other organizations, with other countries with other companies and foundations. I'm a board member of the Linux Foundation uh, board. I chair the board. Uh, I also sit on a number of other advisory boards um, and I consider myself a bridge builder, someone who builds bridges across company and community because we have to work together in order to make this successful. I'm a huge, huge uh, fan of inclusion. We absolutely need to welcome and include everyone in our communities, in our companies, uh, and you have to be an inclusive leader today uh, to succeed. Let's uh, do a little bit about Comcast. We are a media company. Uh, we use a lot of technology to connect people to moments on TV and moments on various form factors um, and experiences that matter to them. Um, we have a number of companies under the umbrella of Comcast. I think most of you know NBC Universal, um, also Sky, which is a company based out of uh, Europe in the UK. Xfinity is the brand through which we deliver internet services and entertainment services and Comcast Business delivers um, all of our services to small, medium, and large businesses. Let's start with um, just recapping what open source means and some of the open source milestones. It really all began with people like Richard Stallman and community leaders who created GNU and the licensed GPL and soon you had Linus Torvalds release Linux under the GPL license and Linux starts becoming widely adopted. And very soon you start seeing towards the end of the 90s institutions like the Open Source Initiative, which oversees licenses and the Linux Foundation and Apache Foundation come into being. Um, these foundations really provided kind of a neutral home for people to collaborate and work together across companies on common projects and common problems. You also see in the early 2000s, the rise of commercial companies based on open source like Red Hat. And today open source dominates the world. And to me, open source uh, really began to work through the pipe, if you will. Uh, a lot of tech vendors like Sun Microsystems, Silicon Graphics, IBM, HP, uh, were initial adopters of open source. Then you had cloud vendors in the phase two, um, such as Google, Amazon, and uh, Microsoft Azure. And then you're starting to see enterprises like Comcast, who are primarily in the media and entertainment business, 
but now becoming software companies and creating software around uh, the business that they are in. And you see Capital One, you see um, Target and Home Depot and enterprises which are now becoming technology and software companies. You're also seeing a wave of open source usage in the government and certainly in verticals and universities, et cetera. So open source is dominant across the world. And the two characteristics in my mind that make open source unique is how open source software is shared with others. It is the license, if you will, which uh, helps you share uh, open source software with certain terminology attached to it, um, such as you shall attribute the copyright, you shall also present the license text, you will present the you know, source code for the software. And then the way it is created, the way it's developed is very unique as well. To me, it's developed using a very collaborative community-based development model where people of very different interests, different countries, different organizations come together and collaborate to produce this software. So this is a very unique aspect of open source um, where there's transparency, there's communication, and there's collaboration to create a common software project. If you dissect the collaborative development model further, you notice that it starts with a common goal, common motivation to solve a problem, to really uh, scratch an itch, as they say in open source. And then, you know, the project establishes governance around how they make decisions, how they will do code review, how they will welcome new people into the project. So it's the culture and the decision-making of the project. And a collaborative development model often includes tools and infrastructure that allow them to collaborate, do code reviews, do pull requests, do common development, um, you know, include comments, include history and documentation, if you will, for that particular project. And collaborative development models are very unique in that they have to be very transparent and very complete in their documentation so that new people can come in and just reading the documentation, they can know uh, where to get involved, what the issues are and how to start contributing. Communications is another big pillar of collaborative development. Open and transparent communications, asynchronous communications through IRC, through chat, through mailing lists, et cetera, and giving people enough time to react to the communications. And there's a saying that if it's not in the mailing list, then it did not happen. And that's very true. You cannot go off into a live meeting and make a decision and not share it with the rest of the community. So communications is a very critical component of collaborative development. And the final component I would say is architecture. Most open source projects try to be very componentized, have a lot of interfaces and not be this big gigantic monolithic mess, which is hard to deal with or hard to maintain or hard to get involved in. So to me, these are five very key components that make collaborative development in open source such a big success. So let's contrast that with how internal company, company development traditionally works. So internal company development or proprietary development often is top down. There is an objective set at the leadership level or a product manager level as to the product that they're going to make. And the requirements are then driven through engineering almost like a waterfall uh, to get work done. And teams often are divided into divisions and managers and they work within their own manager team and own budget. They don't often work across teams. Um, so hence what happens is if there is an expert on databases or there is an expert on AI in one part of the company, there's very little cross leverage um, across the company. So you don't get access to that person. Only that person's team gets access to that person. 
And often in companies and traditional development models, there is no incentive to share or accept contributions across the company. And repos are very private. They're not open for others to collaborate on. Um, and yes, they often do proprietary code development and people are generally co-located in the same physical office. So what happens is it's easy to get up and talk to somebody. And so decisions often are made in the hallway and not documented in the form of uh, communication to the rest of the team. And sometimes the teams own their entire stack and they don't share common infrastructure components, et cetera. And so what happens is there's very much of a, a low reuse of code and there's a great deal of duplicate work being done. And, and you know, a lot of companies use agile and scrum and DevOps way of working. It, it, it works for many companies, but there are also, as you can see, a number of drawbacks to the internal company development model. So what happens is many companies then want to move to um, change their development model. They start seeing the benefit of the open source collaborative development model. And they start saying, we should probably try to adopt this inside our company. And the reason they want to do this is they want to go faster. And, and if you talk to many people, they'll say open source innovates faster than anybody else because it kind of benefits from global innovation and anyone can you know, contribute change and improve the code. Um, companies also want to break down the silos across their divisions and across their teams. They want to encourage more reuse. It, it reduces cost for a company. If you have more reuse of components, you reduce duplication and you create more common platforms upon which teams who are building apps uh, release those apps. And you encourage also, especially today in a very COVID world, for example, at Comcast, we are all working virtually uh, and we'll continue to work virtually till June of next year. And open source practices really help remote and geo dispersed teams collaborate better. And so um, companies are looking for open source as a way to change their development practices. And, and you can see other benefits here. It helps you onboard uh, new developers because code is all documented. It is visible, it's transparent. And you really start getting the benefits of faster and better software development through open source. So this is what's driving many companies to look at inner source as a means of uh, changing the way they develop. So just as a conclusion of this, this section, everyone's using open source today. And to me, the next wave of open source or next wave of change is collaborative development inside the company. So how did the term inner source get started? And there is no gap between inner and source. It's one single word. And I think some of you may recognize these two people in the picture and they have something to do with how the term got started. So companies, I think to some extent in pockets of the company probably were doing some sharing of code, some collaboration, and they were calling it enterprise source. I know at Comcast, there were some teams that were doing development by sharing code across multiple teams. But the term inner source itself as a formal and standard term for collaboration inside the companies started with Tim O'Reilly. Uh, Denise Cooper, who's to your left, uh, tells the story that Tim O'Reilly coined this term uh, back in 2001. And then in 2015 at OSCON, Denise announced Inner Source Commons as a foundation which would encourage and codify and share and educate people on the notion of inner source. And you, you will find a lot of great information on inner source um, practices, patterns, uh, companies that are doing it at innersource.org. So let's look at what's similar between the two. 
And the icon at the top, the green icon, is the open source initiatives icon. And to me, that stands for open source. And the second icon, which looks like a zebra stripe, is the icon that Denise and the Inner Source Commons created to stand for Inner Source. So as you have uh, probably concluded by now, um, the, the development model is common across the two. Both in inner source and in open source, we use a highly collaborative, highly community-based um, development model, and we work, um, you know, very transparently across organizations. And both of these require culture change inside a company. We need uh, people's mindsets to change, especially um, the very proprietary development model with separate teams, separate budgets has to change. The incentives have to change. There should be leadership and sponsorship for making this culture change. It's, it's a foreign way of working, if you will, compared to how companies are used to work before. But the other benefit and the other similarity in my mind in both of these models is that you have better software development practices. You have better quality code, you have more reuse, less cost, and code that can be reused again and again um, by others. And that's one of the, the beauties, I think, of taking the open source model and applying it inside companies. Some of the differences are the motivations for doing inner source sometimes are very different. Motivations may be to go faster, to do it cheaper inside a company, or to work on common you know, frameworks or libraries. Whereas open source often starts with a problem, a technical problem that they want to solve. And inner source may be more, you know, organizational challenges that, that the company is trying to solve. Inner source, as we know, is inside a firewall and is often used to develop proprietary code that may never see open source. Inner source is also not something that you would use for every single project in a company. For example, if there is a project that only that particular team is using or is very niche and does not need to really uh, be collaborated on by others, there is no need to make it into an inner source project. And a lot of the incentives and the management structure inside companies really do need to change in order to encourage collaboration. Instead of judging a manager by how well he or she meets their budgets, how well they accomplish their own goals, it may be um, how well is your project being used by others? How well are you encouraging reuse? Um, are you contributing to reducing cost in the company? Are you contributing to improving uh, competency and software development practices in a company. And typically in inner source projects, you don't use licenses um, because you're sharing, you know, inside a company, you really don't need a license to share inside the company. So how does inner source get started in different companies? And I'll share three different models and I'll share with you how we started it within Comcast as well. The first model is, the company starts using open source, starts working with open source, and then realizes there's so many benefits to the open source development model. I want to now bring it inside the company and start using it inside the company. The second model, as you can imagine, is they may start with inner source. They may say, I, I don't know if I want to open source anything right now, but I have some organizational challenges I want to solve, I want to break down some silos, I want to encourage reuse, I want to encourage collaboration. So they start with inner source first, and then uh, when they realize how easy it is to collaborate, they start realizing the benefits, and then also inner source code becomes more easy to open source. And so they start kind of moving towards open sourcing their code, working with open source communities, etc. And then of course, there are some organizations which kickstart both of them at the same time. For us, um, we really started with open source as a company and then we moved to inner source. Uh, I know that my friend Guy Martin, when he worked at Autodesk, he would say, 
they primarily worked on inner source and then they moved to open source. And then there are a number of companies like PayPal where Denise was, which did both inner and open source at the same time. So there's, there's a school of thought. There are some people who think inner source really kind of is robbing the momentum and the movement from open source. And I'm here to say that yes, the names are different, but they both benefit software development. They both, I think, encourage the same thing, which is transparency, open collaboration, community-based development, it improves, I think, um, how people approach open source. It encourages more people to go into open source. And frankly, especially organizations that are concerned about, you know, jumping right into open source, inner source is a great way to get their feet wet, start learning collaborative development, and then start moving towards a more open source based model. So net net, in my perspective, inner source is the next wave of open source. It's also a huge positive um, encouragement of open source and it validates open source way of doing things. So how did we get started on, on inner source? I'll just give you a brief description of our journey. Um, around 2000s, we started you know, we were very dependent upon vendors. As an enterprise, we did not do any software development. We pretty much bought equipment from vendors and we stood it up and operated it. Um, and around 2006, we started realizing that we wanted to do our own software development. We wanted to be more in control of our own destiny. We knew our business better and we wanted to start consuming uh, software and improving the software. And open source was a perfect place to go to because the source code was available and it was a great starting point and we could then improve upon it or build our own stacks on top of it. And then we started contributing software back into the open source community, whether it was upstreaming bug fixes and patches or it was new projects that we had created and we felt that maybe someone else would also benefit from that. And so we started up uh, a, a consortia called RDK, for example, where we open sourced the set-top box software. We've open sourced uh, a content distribution network to the Apache Foundation. And today we find ourselves doing a lot of external open source, but we also are highly encouraging our development teams to collaborate across the company and we've started doing inner source since 2017. And some of the patterns we see or some of the motivations for open source are, for example, there's one team which said, uh, we are going to be going open source next year, but we want to set it up as an open source project inside the company and really practice our community development uh, skill sets, we want to kind of trial it inside the company. And if it works, then we know we'll be successful in building community once we're out open source. So it's a great staging ground before you go open source. The second is um, there was a component that, you know, three or four teams in the company used, but one team was bearing the burden of maintaining it. So the other teams that were users would just file issues, but never really help with the development. So this team, which was doing all of the burden of development, opened it up, made it a public repo, put some documentation out there, started training their users and said, you are empowered to start contributing to this project and thereby shared the burden, if you will, of the maintenance of that project. It also helped us when two teams were developing similar work to kind of reduce that duplication. And also uh, there is one team, for example, that's collapsing five different applications into one single uh, application. And so it's helping them get all of those teams together to contribute to one common model, if you will, of a future application. 
it's, it's really helpful when uh, teams don't have to wait for the other team to respond to a request that they've made. They can start doing a pull request. They can contribute the change themselves and not have to wait for the priorities of the other team to change in order for their work to get done. So we've seen a tremendous number of benefits in doing um, inner source. We have almost 59 projects that are in our catalog and have advertised that we are open for business. We are open for people to reuse us or to collaborate with us or contribute to us. One way that teams are organized for inner source and open source inside companies is um, the open source program office like the one I run can also take on inner source as one a function and open source is another function. And my team also does a great deal of developer relations and developer advocacy. So to me, it, it's a logical fit inside the open source program office to have a team that's dedicated to helping your developers do inner source, a team that helps with all open source questions and matters, and a team that really focuses on developer relations and enabling our developers to be successful. And the three things we measure from an inner source perspective are um, how many external contributions does a particular team accept? So for example, if team A inside the company has opened up their repo to team B, C, and D, we want to know that more and more of the changes in team A are coming from the outside of team A. Um, that they're genuinely benefiting from collaborative development and that not all changes are being made by team A. Um, we also measure developer productivity and happiness, but there's no one good way to measure this. Um, we are looking at things like ENPS, which is employee net promoter score, developer experience, developer net promoter score, um, is it allowing them to release the cadence of release of the project? Is it speeding up? Are they able to get more work done? Are they able to cover more use cases, et cetera? So all of this really helps us kind of get a sense of um, how developers benefit from inner source and from collaborating with others. And, and as you can see, um, it really results in better speed of development and better scale across the company when you are not duplicating things, but you're actually taking advantage of components and skill sets and people across a huge organization. So in my mind, uh, inner source is a perfect way to start getting the benefits of open source inside the company. So I just wanna conclude by saying, it's really the next wave of open source uh, inside companies. When you find that the whole world is, has adopted open source, the next frontier, if you will, is inside companies changing how proprietary development models are done into a more open source, transparent, more collaborative, more community oriented way. And I hope you found this useful and I'm happy to answer any questions you have and I'll get out of the full screen mode and um, get into questions. Thank you so much, Nithya. Um, I'm just checking the QA and we currently don't have any questions in there. So I encourage any of the participants if they have questions, please add them to the QA. Um, also looking at the chat and I'm not seeing any questions yet. So just thank you. <laughs> I think that's a good one. Um, someone commenting on measuring and metric. And I have to say that's also a personal interest for me. I've been working with the chaos group and we're constantly thinking about how to measure and attribute um, performance and other and other methods. It's not all about performance and creation, but what are the things that we can look at to measure? And I, I think about it a lot in terms of also being part of an open source programs office. Once we start instituting measurements, there's always the consideration of how is that gonna change behavior? So are we showcasing the right types of things that encourage more 
team collaboration. I really like that external contributors, how many people are actually successfully working across silos between teams. So thank you for sharing that and sharing a little bit about how your OSPO is run. I thought that was quite interesting to hear. Yes. And, and uh, frankly, you know, Google's OSPO was one of the first ones um, that was set up. Uh, Christy Bono uh, set that up. And uh, I work very closely with Chris and with lots of other OSPO leaders in, a, in, a, in an organization called the To Do Group. And uh, we tend to share our learnings and best practices across the two groups. There's a, a really good question from Jonathan Brink on the use of trusted committers. And I think that's a fantastic suggestion. Uh, we've been playing with that idea as well, uh, both for external contributions, Jonathan, where we want to reward people who have done a good job of you know, following the practices, best practices, if you will, from a contribution perspective. And we make sure that they are um, given the respect that they deserve and they go, they have a faster track, if you will, to contribution. And even inside for inner source, we we are playing with the notion of trusted committers. You know, certainty, certain members have earned the right to um, you know, contribute to each other's projects and they're doing things right. Um, so we're doing that. Thank you again for uh, your comment on the wooden craft behind me. Um, it's a fantastic uh, wooden carving made in my hometown of Bangalore, India. And uh, it's one of my favorite, favorite um, pictures. It's, it's the life of Krishna, many different aspects of the life of Krishna. So it looks like we have an, another question that popped up in the QA from Wolfgang. And if you're looking at it, I can read it to you in case that's difficult to find. Um, can you please elaborate a bit on developer happiness as a metric or measurement? That's a, such a great question, Wolfgang. Thank you so much. Um, so as a company, we've been doing a lot of ENPS measurements, which is employee net promoter score. Um, so once a quarter, we measure uh, how employees are doing, are they happy? Are there areas that they are concerned about? And so what we as a software development team and open source team were thinking of doing is adding questions to the ENPS um, to ask for, um, since you adopted you know, inner source, um, has that reduced the friction in your work or has that speeded up your development or has that helped you collaborate better or get work done better. So we are still playing with some of those um, types of measurements. Um, we've also been looking at, of course, you know, traditional surveys uh, to reach out to teams to say, um, you know, I, I see that you've been using inner source for the last year. How is this practice working out for you? Um, and get more qualitative information, you know, from, from that perspective. Um, it's, it's not easy. And, and I'd be very curious, Wolfgang, and also everybody else, if you have any suggestions for how we can do a better job of measuring developer happiness, I would love to get your perspectives on that. Thank you, Nithya. Um, we have a second question from Mauricio. How do you avoid projects from becoming tied to your internal models? Do you have documentation with guidelines on how to write united code, united in quotation marks? Or untied code? Untied. Or? Oh my goodness. <laughs> untied code. Yeah. Um, we, what we've done is we've uh, provided a checklist of best practices for people who are starting an inner source project. And we then audit those projects also to make sure that they are following those best practices. Um, we are trying to get them to um, architect the projects differently, you know, more modular, more componentized, document it better, have a very set governance rules for how code is reviewed, how code is approved. Um, so hopefully those types of things are, you know, helping us. I haven't seen too many projects become tied to the traditional model, Mauricio, at least the ones that have adopted inner source and kind of are badged as inner source, they, they seem to follow uh, 
um, the, um, you know, the, the things that we've uh, provided to them, the, the checklist, if you will. It's a good question. I, I we think about that a lot at Google as well. And I think the models are more similar than the tooling. I think that's where we run into some trouble. Um, when they're, you're trying to bring a project into an external forum, um, you don't have the same tools accessible that we have internally for a Google engineer. So there's either the choice to write completely using external tooling, which a lot of our projects do, the ones that are already in, in published in open source forums, but the projects that we want to externalize and bring out there, there is a bit of a transition period between not just the model itself, but the tooling around it, how even code is released. Let's say we use Garrett in a lot of these forms, but maybe you weren't using that in another place. So how do you transition to a model that's now accessible to external contributors? Um, and I, I feel like that probably could also come into play. Absolutely. And, and certain language and certain communities have certain norms to your point, Sophia. And so we have to do a lot of thought about does the license match what the Java community uses or do the tools match what that community uses and where does the community congregate and how do we kind of you know, post our project there? Um, so very, very good point. Um, let's see if there are no other questions, I'm happy to take on any other questions or to clear the floor for my uh, fellow speaker. Okay, by the way, we do have an inner source license because we are a multinational company consisting of, yes, I, I thought about Wolfgang's model. So his question is, we do have an inner source license because we're a multinational company consisting of many legal entities. So it seemed like a good idea this does, however, make the inner source to open source staging a bit more difficult. Yes. So Wolfgang is a fellow member of the Inner Source Common Summit. Um, and I remember you mentioning that there, Wolfgang. Essentially, what, what he's talking about is if an umbrella company like Alphabet, for example, and there are multiple entities under Alphabet, Google being one, and you know, so on and so forth, then cross entity they're separate legal entities under the same umbrella. So they have to license across those entities. For us, for example, Sky and Comcast, if I create something here, I may need to cross license to um, Sky. One of the things we're doing to avoid that Wolfgang is we are just open sourcing something and then Sky becomes just another member of that open source community and thereby, and, and clearly not everything can be open sourced, but that's helped us solve the problem in cross entity uh, collaboration, if you will. Thank you, that, that was interesting for me to hear as well. Okay. Thank you, Mauricio. Appreciate it. Thank you. Still have five minutes. Um, I'll stick around for a few more minutes um, and then we'll transition to the next track in preparation. Wow, I thought I, I would take too long. So I just kind of breeze through the material. <laughs> Hey, I, everyone's been ending a bit earlier. I think it's it's kind of wonderful because then we have this space to just digest and discuss. Um, so I've been enjoying the breaks. <laughs> um, we have another comment. Thank you. Um, I appreciated the ending on metrics too. Again, I've, I've been working with chaos. Um, we talk a lot about metrics. Um, and I think, especially as someone who, who works in an OSPO and then works with chaos, there's, we're constantly having questions around how we're thinking about measuring community projects and community health, but also how are we measuring internally in terms of what we care about and whether or not we're being productive as an organization. And because we're 
a kind of a service entity within our company. Um, we're in helping people to engage in these communities in a compliant way, <laughs> licensing being at the root of that so that we are using everything appropriately and contributing back and reopening things back appropriately. So there's a lot of automation and linting checks that we run uh, across our compliance team, but it's measurement is key to all of that in terms of keeping track of what we do and whether or not we are we are focusing on the right things and especially revealing for us within OSPO, are we providing the right services, the right kinds of incentives and feedback so that our teams can continue to be productive internally. You hit it on the nail, uh, Sophia. Um, that's exactly what I worry about too. I worry about is the OSPO itself being effective and efficient and making an impact, positive impact, right, on the company? And then is compliance, are we doing it right? And uh, where are there gaps and how do we improve that? And then of course, there's the external side, which community should we get involved in? How do we contribute? So there's the OSPO effectiveness, there's the external, there's the internal, and, and and incentives can go wrong and it can create the wrong behaviors as you point out. We are very involved uh, or at least um, periodically we check in with chaos and try to understand how that's going. Jonathan says, going a bit further regarding trusted committers, any thoughts on having dedicated TCs who serve as the only gateway to getting code pushed perhaps having a dedicated TC per sprint and passing that role around to a few people. Are there any companies that are following this model? For example, in Garrett, only granting the TC the power to a plus two. Um, in a previous company I worked for, we did have a trusted committer and he was the only person through which we made any upstream changes or any code changes to Ceph, which was the project that we were contributing to. Um, we just felt that this person could oversee and make sure that the code was created correctly. It was the right thing to do. And he or she knew the process for getting legal approval and you know, knew how to do it right. So this was the person through which we went through the, to the project. I think we're doing that in a few other places where we have a lot of people contributing to um, the same project, we are trying to funnel it through one or two main trusted uh, committers. Um, thank you for that. We do have one more question that popped up uh, in the QA uh, from Mauricio again. Since we still have time, does Comcast have something like a GitHub enterprise space where all the public code is shared? Uh, yes, Mauricio, we are standardized on GitHub enterprise. So, um, which makes it really, really easy to um, kind of encourage open source collaboration inside the company. There are pockets of the company that are using other uh, solutions like GitLab and other things, but predominantly Git, uh, GitHub Enterprise is the way we collaborate inside the company. Okay. Oh, I had one more question for you. I know it's like a minute and we're shoving it in, but you are you are part of the to-do group as well. And I was reviewing the last round of the 2020 survey. Um, and one of the questions was how are OSPOs rating their own success? Um, and the top rated thing was open source culture. Um, and I'm in my head, I was thinking, is that apply to an inner source model? But I was kind of curious to get your thoughts if you had any sort of background on what was intended by that question or how you viewed it. Uh, how do you, can, uh, could you repeat that again, please? Uh, so the was how, how OSPOs measure their success. Um, and then the top response was open source culture within the company. Um, the second being developer productivity. So I was just kind of curious if you had thoughts on measuring culture and whether or not something like the things you've talked about around inner source are part of that. To me, um, yes. So one of the things we look at, and, and it's probably an, in um, not a very exact science, but we have a Slack channel for open source, for example. So we measure is, is the number of people joining the Slack channel increasing over the years, right? And we've had, we went from, three, four years ago with 10, 15 people to thousands of people now on the channel. 
and we look at how engaged are people. Um, we sometimes hardly ever have to answer questions as the OSPO because there's so many enthusiasts and ambassadors in the company who'll jump in and answer questions for each other. So I think that's a measure. The adoption of open source programs that we have, um, whether it's inner source or um, other practices inside the company, I look at that and say, how widely are we attracting developers to you know, work in this way? How many contributions do we make as a company um, is another way I look at success. Um, and frankly, um, when we do talks, when we encourage people to do talks in open source conferences, we are seeing such an uptick now of attendance. And um, it's seen as a huge positive. Frankly, it also helps us recruit better when people know that we are a company that encourages open source and support open source practices. Um, in fact, yeah, it, all of these things uh, is, are things that I look at. 